Okay, guys, we have a lot to cover today. <laughs> so, um, we'll see how well we do. Uh, your favorite bill in the Bill of Rights is the First Amendment with 53%, the Fourth at a distance second with 23%, and the Fifth and the Eighth. Uh, and then we have your favorite part of the First Amendment, 57% going to speech and press, 23% free exercise, and 11% no establishment with freedom to assemble and petition coming in last. We're going to talk today about civil rights. Uh, which are different than civil liberties, which I will explain as we go on. And I think that some of your fellows have also had this discussion with you the difference between civil rights and civil liberties. Um, but let's talk about uh, what's promised here, right? So there's some promise in our founding ideals, right? Jefferson says, we hold these truths self-evident that all men are created equal. He's going to denounce slavery as a cruel war against human nature in the original draft of the Declaration. At the Constitutional Convention, James Madison is going to denounce slavery as the most oppressive dominion ever exercised by man over man. All other major figures of the founding are also going to denounce slavery. However, slavery is explicit left in the Constitution. So why did they compromise? In part because they needed the South in order to form this new government. And they believed that these truths of equality and justice would be borne out in a short time if there was just a structure of government that would allow for the change. Jefferson also felt that the tree of liberty must be watered or refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. He didn't expect it to be a revolution. While the ideals persisted, oppression remained. And so Frederick Douglass, writing in the 1850s, says the natural rights principles of the Declaration of Independence were universally and permanently true. He says the everlasting glory of America's founding lay in its dedication to those principles and that its salvation lay in its rededication to them. He said America has the capacity to secure justice for all, irrespective of race, color, sex, or creed. Frederick Douglass among the founders of the women's rights movement as well. So there are civil rights and there are civil movements and civil rights movements. Civil rights are those positive acts of government so an act of government to protect against arbitrary or discriminatory treatment by government or individuals, okay? Civil rights is going to be an act of government to correct discriminatory action, arbitrary treatment. Movements, civil rights movements, are actions taken by individuals or groups to urge government action on a civil liberties or discriminatory public policy issue. Civil rights movements are meant for the purpose of saying, hey, government, you need to do something. Okay? We've seen civil rights movements throughout our history. And we're going to talk about a couple of them specifically. Prior to the Civil War, beginning in 1692, the United States, before it was even a country, had slavery. The abolitionist movement actually begins in the United States in the 1750s, 60s, 70s, uh, 1770s, whenever the advocation for a new country is beginning anyway. So we see an abolitionist movement beginning around the same time as the revolution. 
The South, however, economically, the people in power were dependent upon cheap slave labor. And so they pushed back. In the North, in Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, there are black codes that are passed by 1804. Prohibiting free black persons from settling, being seen in public, or voting in those states. In 1808, Congress is going to ban the slave trade. Now, something else that's in the Constitution is it specifically said the slave trade could not be banned for 20 years. 20 years after its ratification, Congress bans the slave trade. And so the abolitionist movement have been really working to get this to happen. And one of the things that we find about movements is they come in waves, waves because people get tired. Right? You guys are living in interesting times, and I'm sorry. But the thing is, is I think that almost all times are interesting. And so there's a lot of struggle. In 1820, Missouri is going to apply for admission to the Union as a slave state. This brings to fore the issues around slavery that people have been ignoring. In particular, what happens is, in terms of balance of power, the Senate would be unbalanced, right? It would no longer be half slave states, half free states. So a compromise is reached where Maine is added as a state because Maine had been, you guys know where Maine is? It had been part of Massachusetts. So it gets broken off from Massachusetts and it's now its own state, Maine. And there's a line set, 36 latitude, no slavery above this line. The abolitionist movement is going to restart in earnest in 1833. We're going to have William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton are going to be some of the key leaders of this movement. One of the big issues with the anti, um, the American Anti-Slavery Society is that they had these lectures that would go around and they would say, hey, look, slavery is bad. Let us tell you why, okay? And let's talk about this. And a lot of their key lecturers were women. And what these women found was that they also did not have any rights. They couldn't go on a train by themselves. They couldn't stay in hotels by themselves. They weren't allowed into certain places where they were supposed to be lecturing. And so in 1848, these same members of the American Anti-Slavery Society also formed a women's movement. And they signed the, the, at the Seneca Falls Convention, a declaration of sentiments as to the rights of women. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are equal. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward women, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. They have a list of grievances, which include no right to vote, no representation, no say in laws to which she submits, considered property, no right to private property, no right to education, no right to raise her own children. In 1857, Dred Scott, who had been taken multiple times across that 36 line parallel latitude, sued and said, hey, look, these are free states, and I've been in free states, I am free. The Supreme Court, led by Chief Justice Taney, said no. 
specifically, Taney said, persons of color are not U.S. citizens. Taney went on to say, Congress has no authority to legislate slavery issues. This is a blatant misreading of the Constitution, but it creates the precedent that democratic ideals are only for white men. Following this, in 1860, you have the election of Abraham Lincoln as a candidate for the Republican Party. Basically, the Republican Party um, takes together the old, the remnants of what is left of the Federalists, okay, and uh, anti abolitionist movements, okay, and he wins in large part because of a strong sentiment against slavery and also backlash against the Dred Scott decision. People saying, this is wrong. And so he's going to win the office of president. The response in the South is that there's fear the anti-slavery sentiment will spread and this will end slavery. And so the South secedes firing against the United States in an act of treason. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. In it, he says, all slaves within any state or designated part of a state then in rebellion shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. What's he missing? Okay. What? States that, states that are not in rebellion. Because there were slaves in states that were not in rebellion. But words matter. Just as we see the Declaration of Independence come back in the writings of Frederick Douglass, come back in the um, uh, Seneca Falls Convention's Declaration of Sentiments, come back, frankly, in the Emancipation Proclamation. These words help the North cause. People were flagging. It had been a couple of years. And they helped to win the war. Following the Civil War, there are three amendments passed. And in order for any states that had, were still in rebellion, who were the losers of this war, to re enter the United States, they had to agree to these amendments. The 13th Amendment is says, no slavery. The South, however, imported those black codes from Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and still prohibited black Americans from voting, sitting on juries. The 14th Amendment gives equal protection and due process of law. We've talked about due process of law in terms of civil liberties, right? Because of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, that's why we say, hey, states, you cannot restrict my speech either. Okay? But the equal protection clause says you can also not treat people differently. The 15th Amendment gives black men citizenship, and the right to vote. Now, technically, it gives all men. But in practice and in what happened, black men and white men, okay? This leaves out significant numbers of people. And it leaves out women. This split the suffrage movement quite a bit, actually, in part because of racism, okay? 
uh, but also in part because they said, hey, look, we should fight for our right to vote too at the same time. We've been fighting against slavery. And so it was a disappointment. Southern defiance after Civil War and their refusal to enforce the 14th Amendment leads to the 1875 Civil Rights Act. The 1875 Civil Rights Act, incidentally, looks a lot like the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But courts still upheld Jim Crow laws, dividing societies, and the Supreme Court said, that's fine, you can do that, in the civil rights cases of 1883. They said, those are okay. South's gonna use poll taxes, white-only primaries and literacy tests. Grandfather clauses allowed poor white people who were also illiterate to continue to vote. They did not have to take the same test or pay the same taxes. So here's some questions for you from a literacy test from the state of Louisiana. You have 10 minutes. You get one wrong and you fail, okay? Number one, draw a line around the number or letter of this sentence. What do you do? What do you do? What? Anyone? You circle the one. Okay. Well, lines are straight, but okay. Draw a line around the last word in this line. What are you going to do? Where are you going to draw that line? Under what? Under line, right? But the last word in that line is actually word. Or is it line? Um, I don't know. Right? It could be either one. Draw, cross out the longest word in this line. What's your instinct? Cross out longest. But the longest word is still word. Right? And also, what's a cross? We'll get to that in a second. Draw a line around the shortest word in this line. Your instinct? That's word, but maybe it's A. That's what my instinct is. Right? Circle the first, first letter of the alphabet in this line. I'll tell you, I, I can only find one answer for this one, okay? I, I feel like this may actually be a somewhat fair question. The A in alphabet, it's the only one I can find. If you guys find another way to answer that, you tell me. In the space below, draw three circles, one inside the other. And I'm gonna show you, this is, this is the way I would do it, okay? If I were to do it, I would do it just like this. I would draw, Circle, circle, circle. Three circles, one inside the other. Okay. But maybe what it meant was draw three circles, one inside the other. Right? What does it mean? Okay. The next question above the letter X, make a small cross which gets us back to crossing out that word. Start to doubt it, right? Did I exit instead of cross it? Draw a line through the letter below that comes earliest in the alphabet. C at the end. Draw a line through the letter below that comes last in the alphabet. Z, but it's still tricky, right? In the space below, write the word noise backwards and place a dot over what would be its second letter should it have been written forward. First of all, what a terrible sentence. But second of all, what do they want me to do, right? So I can go like this. Right? But what if they want it completely backwards? Okay, hold on. Like, I don't know, right? But hey, let's suppose I have a sympathetic tester. And I can answer this in a way that they would answer. Here's your last question. 
Good luck. Wait, how are they going to know that? Yeah. How are they? How are they? Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Don't worry, Plessy says, hey, look, I'm actually white. I'm seven inch white, I'm white. And so I'm gonna ride the whites only car. And uh, they say, no, out you go. And he says, uh, no, I'm gonna stay here, 14th Amendment. They say, you're arrested, so he's arrested. Plessy's gonna sue. He's gonna say the 14th Amendment makes racial segregation illegal, okay? Supreme Court, however, ruled in Plessy that the Louisiana law was constitutional and separate but equal facilities for Blacks did not violate the Equal Protection Clause. Separate but equal. The High Court Plessy ruling led to more Jim Crow laws. By 1914, every Southern state had passed laws that created two separate societies, one Black, one White. And they were mandatory. Okay? If I own a restaurant, I cannot choose to allow everyone to come in. They're mandatory. Required racial se separation in schools, restaurants, hotels, public transportation, theaters, restrooms, and in marriage. Okay? There's one dissenter in this, Justice Harlan. He said, in essence, this is a bad decision, and it's going to lead to war. Same time, the women's equality movement is still going forward, trying to get the right to vote. So suffrage is the central focus. Just so you know, right now, there are two people running for U.S. representative who say that women's suffrage needs to be revealed. Okay. It's led by the National American Woman Suffrage Association. That's Carrie Chapman Hatch. She's quite a Hatch character. Um, and then the National Women Congress, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. All right. Now, NASA is the one that talks to members of Congress, goes to different states. They do a lot of lobbying. They have, you know, she meets with the president, lobbying for the women's right to vote. Okay. But the National Women's Con Congress starts using Henry David Thoreau, right? Remember Henry David Thoreau? We talked about him. And they start using nonviolent protests. So they petition outside the White House with signs. That's them. They have parades. They show up places to vote. They also have fire hoses and dogs put on them. They're also thrown in prison. They're also, when they conduct hunger strikes, nonviolent protests, force fed. The two different groups acting together do finally achieve the vote with the 19th Amendment in 1920. So, your favorite amendment that is a non Bill of Rights amendment. All right, there you go. And in just a second, you guys are going to say something like, hey, take attendance. Okay. All right. Somebody's going to say this. All right. So, uh, favorite non Bill of Rights Amendment 13th, no slavery. 14th, rights of citizens and states are protected. 15th, all men can vote. And 19th, all men and all women can vote. So, as I said, even though there are these rights to citizenship and voting, things are not equal. The NAACP is formed in the 19 aughts with the express purpose of trying to achieve equality under the law 
They lobby Congress, presidents, state governments. But in the 1930s, they start a new approach, the LDF, the Legal Defense Fund. And Thurgood Marshall is going to be their lead counsel, all right? And they're going to start testing cases in segregation. So Ada Lewis Sibyl and her brother went to school at Langston in Oklahoma. She's from Chickasha. Anybody from Chickasha? No? I only had one in my last class, too. I need to recruit better from Chickasha. Um, so um, she's from Chickasha. She and her brother both, they went to school at Langston. And her brother was actually recruited you know, hey, we want to test this. We don't think that there, there's not a law school in Oklahoma that is equal to the OU law school. And he said, no, thank you. I'm going to go somewhere else. And he did. He was very successful. And Ada Lois Sabul said, you know what? I'll do it. And so she did. She applied to the University of Oklahoma, and at the time, the law school was actually right there. And the president of the university was over all of it. And he specifically rejected her from OU in a letter that said, in essence, this. You're very well qualified. However, I cannot admit you to the University of Oklahoma Law School because you are not white. Why do you write it like that? Why didn't you write it like that? It's direct evidence and can't be interpreted any other way. It's direct evidence and cannot be interpreted any other way. He did it on purpose. And so at the Supreme Court, it's very clear she was denied admission based on her race alone. And the Supreme Court said this. They said, separate but equal is not equal when it comes to law schools. Because in law schools, it's a professional school, you know, you get to know judges, your fellow attorneys. And so you need to know them for this to be equal, right? It's part of the profession itself. They don't accept the argument that Thurgood Marshall has been making for a while and will continue to make. He makes it sweat the painter. He makes it uh, in Texas. He makes it again here in Oklahoma about admission to the university. And they say, this is a flagship school. And so therefore there's not another equal to the University of Oklahoma, which we all knew that, right? But in 1954, Supreme Court, this is about their eighth case on this. <laughs> Here's Brown versus Board of Education. Linda Carroll Brown cannot attend her nearest school. She has to walk to the nearest school for people of color. And the Supreme Court says, you know what, Thurgood Marshall? You're right. It is not possible for separate to be equal. The intellectual, psychological, and financial damage that is befalling Black Americans precludes a finding of set under the separate but equal doctrine. Separate is inherently unequal. Overturning Plessy v. Ferguson. Brown two in 1955 says, hey, we're serious. Dismantle it, right? Which allows Eisenhower to activate the National Guard in many states to dismantle public systems. On the backs of these court, on this court victory in particular, there have been there's been a movement. The NAACP, like I said, has been lobbying for years. And uh, Rosa Parks works for the NAACP. Okay. Secretary. And she rides a bus to work. And on the bus, there's the front of the bus, right? And then right here, there's a sign 
So we go to a line, right? So the other side it says color. Okay. Right here. And so she sits down here. With three of her friends, with three of her co-workers. But the bus fills up. So the bus driver comes because a white man gets on the bus and moves the cord to there. Moves the sign to there. <coughs> he says, you need to get up. You're going to get arrested. And then three people she was with did get up. And I want you to think about that. Because first of all, this was brave in the first place. But second of all, she didn't want you to go alone. So she was arrested. And the result was a Montgomery bus boycott. Now, they wanted someone to leave this that was famous. Sadly, the guy they wanted wasn't available. So they called on a young preacher named Martin Luther King Jr. And after a year of ride sharing, buses being donated, freedom rides, the bus company capitulated because they went bankrupt without people riding their bus. We see the beginning of this nonviolent movement, what's known as the modern civil rights movement. I know this is 60 years ago, but 70 years ago. But it's considered the modern movement. Boycotts, sit-ins, freedom rights, marches, a lot of what Lucy Burns and Alice Paul and Mahatma Gandhi advocated. So in letter from Birmingham jail, we talked about this. <clears throat> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is arrested in the jail. He's writing on scraps of paper, something that we now read in our classes, part of American history, right? Part of our democratic, patriotic history. And he lays out the steps to nonviolent campaign. He collect the facts. In other words, what's going on here? Right? Is there some way we can negotiate step two? And then if not, he talks about self-purification. Why self-purification? What does that even mean? Why would you do that? Why would you say this is part of the process? Somebody hits me, I would like to do what? I would like to hit them back. I would. Right? It says, look, can't. You have to be better. And he says, so don't do it, right? This isn't for you. Which is fair, right? But part of nonviolent protest meant you took it. And then you engaged in direct action. And again, dogs, water hoses, direct beatings, arrests, death. These are the outcomes. But this movement oh, had lots of repercussions. This is me, the Birmingham 16th Avenue Baptist Church. These are my kids. My daughter Ivy said, Why are these little girls out? And I said, 
because a man bombed this church and blew them up while they were getting ready for church out of hate. Civil Rights Act of 1964, because of this movement, because of decades of this movement, the sign. Bar discrimination in public facilities, private businesses, employment, and education. Provides for federal intervention, 14th Amendment. It creates equal employment opportunity commission. It applies to race, color, religion, origin, and sex. Incidentally, that sex bit was added on the floor as an amendment in an effort to sink the bill as a whole. So here's the impact. White Southerners are gonna argue that the act is unconstitutional. We're gonna start seeing um, calls for nullification of laws, secession. We're gonna start, there's gonna be a movement toward the Republican party, away from the Democratic party, from the solid South Democratic party. States rights become an issue. We have state imposed, in other words, legal de jure, that means legal, okay? Segregation eliminated at once. Now, 10 years after Brown, however, less than 1% of African-American children in the South attended integrated schools. That's de facto. That means in fact, it was not the same. Over time, these rulings and laws have opened up numerous occupations to minorities and women's and women's women. <laughs> uh, but the women's rights movement, we're going to see piggybacks on the modern civil rights movement. In 1961, uh, President Kennedy commissions a uh, investigation, a study on the status of women, and finds that there is pervasive discrimination against women. Pervasive means in all aspects of life, whether it be church, home, in employment, in the streets, in education, in all areas of life, women are discriminated in every single aspect. Betty Friedan writes in the Feminine Mystique about how women are forced to subsume their identity and only find their identity in their husbands or in their children. In 1966, we have now the National Organization for Women suing because the EEOC did not enforce provisions that protected equal rights of women in employment. And the Congress is going to pass the ERA in the 1970s. The Equal Rights Amendment, however, time ran out before states had brought it for a vote, and so it did not pass. American Indians. Have a unique status under U.S. law. Oh, did I say this part? The group that benefited most from the 1964 Civil Rights Act, white middle class women. The demographic status of women in terms of their socioeconomic power, it was white middle class women that benefited more than any other group. American Indians, have a unique status under US law. They're sovereign. We heard Dan Callison talk about this, but they were the last group to get the right to vote, even though the 15th Amendment would suggest or otherwise. Issues education, we talked about the boarding schools, uh, religious freedom, water, hunting, fishing, land rights. Many of you have read Killers and Flower Moon, right? We've also been talking about it being uh, cast, if you've read cast and download. I think all of these things are playing into what you're reading right now. And the paper's due on Friday. Asian Americans are the fastest growing minority group in the United States, but there's a limited pan-Asian identity um, 
people don't necessarily see themselves as Asian. They see themselves as um, of this particular country of origin or of this religion. Um, and so there's not a lot of coalesced um, action for Asian Americans. Uh, they have long suffered from uh, restrictions on immigration and employment. Uh, we see the Chinese Exclusion Act at the end of the 1800s. We see the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, and recently we see attacks on Asians increasing um, in the United States. Latino Americans are the largest minority group in the U.S., Activism and rallies are going to begin again on the back of the Black uh, Civil Rights Movement. Um, they're going to face economic discrimination and segregation as well. Um, we have the United Farm Workers that's led by Cesar Chavez. He, he engages in hunger strikes and boycotts um, for to protect workers' rights, but to protect the rights of Latinos who are engaged in uh, agriculture in particular, but voting, education, immigration, all of these are issues today. Civil rights for the disabled. In 1990, the American Disabilities Act is passed. Um, any of those of you who get any sort of benefit from ADRC or, for example, um, you know, enjoy having stairs that are not terrible, um, that is because of the civil rights um, or disabled under the Americans with Disabilities Act is going to guarantee that there is equal access to public and private facilities. I have three things to say about affirmative action, and then I'll say who. So I'm going to start. You ready? Oh, good call. Let's do attendance, and then I'll say something about affirmative action. Okay, it's live. All right, so here's the things about affirmative action. Are you ready? The point of affirmative action, the entire point of affirmative action is to aid people who have been historically disadvantaged to try to level the playing field. That is the idea. Understand that quotas have not existed in terms of affirmative action since 1976. You see a lot of talk about this whenever you hear kind of pushback against affirmative action saying, well, quotas aren't fair. Well, there aren't any quotas. Quotas have been illegal since 1976. Um, quotas are not acceptable. Some preference is okay if the purpose is to forward diversity or some other social goal. There are some statutory remedies like the Equal Pay Act of 63, uh, Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act of 64, and Title IX of the Education Amendment of 1972, which in particular gave a tremendous aid to women, giving equality in sports and sports funding. Um, equal Protection Clause gets us back to those founding ideals, right? Without compromise. There are three different standards of review most laws are subject to a rational basis test. For example, the Supreme Court just said in Dobbs that abortion is rational basis. Therefore, states can pass whatever they want because there is no heightened scrutiny in regard to sex. They specifically say this in the Dobbs decision. Um, any law that interferes with civil liberties and voting rights and processes is also subject to strict scrutiny by the court. I'll see you guys on Friday. Until then, boomer. <laughs>